So this will be a general overview about ovarian cancer. And, um, and different people are going to know different amounts. So I'm just going to cover the basics. And then we'll delve in more probably in question and answer. OK? So let's see if this works. All right. Ovarian cancer. So that term in general and the treatments that we will talk about refers to whether the cancer is, yeah, sure, no problem, originating in the ovaries, uh, the fallopian tubes, or what uh, is called the peritoneum, which is a lining of, you know, sort of like if you, you know, if you open up a human being, like there's as if it's a curtain covering the whole body. So, yeah, so it's a lining, the peritoneum is a lining that covers the stomach and intestines. So cancer of that also are also treated like ovarian cancer. So if somebody hears they have peritoneal carcinomatosis, or if they have ovarian cancer, or cancer of the fallopian tube, they all are kind of on the same umbrella of ovarian cancer, the way they're treated. So it's the fifth leading cause of death uh, in women uh, in the US. And unfortunately, it has a, not a good mortality rate in the sense that a lot of people that are diagnosed, unfortunately, end up passing away from ovarian cancer. Uh, so the numbers are not as favorable as, say, breast cancer uh, or other uh, malignancies. Uh, so out of, like, we have 22,000 new cases a year and 14,000 deaths a year. So that's more than half. Um, average ages diagnosis is later. Uh, 63, so people in their 60s, that's, uh, that would be the average age. And if um, somebody has a genetic mutation, uh, the main ones are the BRCA genes, BRCA genes, then the risk is much higher. So 35 to 46% for BRCA1 and a little bit lower, but still high for BRCA2 mutations. Um, these are the same genes that also increase the risk of uh, breast cancer. Um, not every gene has overlapping uh, between these two cancers, but these two do. Risk factors. So there are some known risk factors for ovarian cancer, um, some of which are outside of one's control. Uh, but they are still risk factors. So early menarche and late menopause. The earlier a woman starts having periods and the later she has menopause, um, basically the duration of time that um, her ovaries are working, that increases the risk of ovarian cancer. Nulliparity, that means a woman who's never had a child. Um, or infertility in general. Um, the more children one has, the more protective it is in terms of ovarian cancer. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, that is, a, um, that is a syndrome that some people suffer with. It causes irregular menses and basically cysts in the ovaries. That, as well as endometriosis, um, which is a condition of the uterus per se, but um, they, both of them uh, increase the risk of ovarian cancer. Genetics, so BRCA, I kind of mentioned already. Uh, there's another family, um, uh, family genetic disorder called Lynch syndrome um, that is not linked to breast, but ovarian and colon cancer. So that's another one that if families have see that they have both ovarian as well as um, uh, colon cancer or uterine cancer, Lynch syndrome is something to consider. And then things that maybe perhaps you know, people can control, environmental. Smoking seems to have some correlation with ovarian, but unclear if it's you know, super strong or not. Presentation, unfortunately, doesn't have any good warning signs. Um, it's not like uh, breast cancer that a woman feels a lump, and they come in, and they get evaluated. Um, ovarian cancer rarely presents with a lump you can actually feel from the outside. Um, so usually it's very vague symptoms. Uh, bloating, abdominal pain maybe, maybe difficulties with bowel movement, um, but very nonspecific, um, which is why a lot of times it presents late. By the time you find out about it, it's not just in the ovary. Sometimes you get lucky and somebody's having an ultrasound for some other reason and they find out they have ovarian cancer. And then you can catch it early. Um, but as a result, usually it's uh, late, um, at, advanced at the time of presentation. 
In terms of staging, so for every cancer, staging is basically where it is, where it has spread. Um, so the way in ovarian cancer it works, you first look at, is it just in the ovaries? Is it just in the fallopian tubes? Has it spread to the lining of the uh, intestine, like the peritoneum? Is it outside of the abdominal cavity? Those would be the different stages uh, that it would go through. And lymph, uh, and lymph nodes. So at the time of diagnosis, everybody gets a whole body scan, a CT scan, to try to figure out where it could possibly be, um, as well as it has a tumor marker, uh, a blood test that one can do. It's called CA125. It's a protein that's excreted by most, but not all, ovarian cancers. And you can pick it up in the blood. Um, so that is not really used for diagnosis per se, because sometimes it doesn't go up and somebody has ovarian cancer, and somebody has, sometimes it's up and it's not ovarian cancer, but it's used for following. So if someone we know has ovarian cancer, we check this protein, note the level, and then as we put them on therapy, whether it's surgery or whatnot, then we'll see if it comes down. Um, we're trying to keep questions for the end. Is it something that can wait, maybe? I just wanted to know about yes. inhibit A or B. Inhibin AOB? That is not a test that is typically checked, so I'm not sure uh, that can, why your doctor is checking those. So you may have to want to talk to them. I'm not sure. That's not a common test for this. So let's see. In terms of therapy, so when somebody's diagnosed, we know they have ovarian cancer. Um, therapy usually involves first surgery. There are some cancers that first somebody would get chemotherapy or only get chemotherapy and or radiation. Uh, for ovarian cancer, typically, no matter the stage, the first step is surgery. And you're trying to, what we call debulk, basically take as much of the cancer out as possible, even if you cannot take it all, because that does improve survival. Uh, even if you cannot eliminate it, to try to take it as much as possible. So it's a very specialized surgery. Um, if somebody has ovarian cancer, preferably the surgery should be done by a specialized gyne onc surgeon, so gynecologist, oncologist, not your run-of-the-mill general, uh, general gynecologist, because it's not as simple as just taking out the ovaries. They need to take out the lymph nodes. They need to take out the lining of the uh, of the intestines and the peritoneum. So it's not very straightforward and it's an open procedure, so usually they need more than that, yes. Is that lining of the omentum? Or? Yeah, omentum slash peritoneum. Okay. That's what we're talking Is it about. A problem that they don't take out the omentum? So the peritoneum they should, at least they should sample it. The, but, we but questions my, yes. And mm -hmm. then have the presentation that was requested at the beginning. We'll, I promise we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions. Um, but generally, we don't. Generally, we don't take everything, but as much as possible. Um, and then, um, basically, you know, this I already mentioned, these are all um, ovarian, fallopian tube, and peritoneal carcinoma are considered a single uh, clinical entity. And the goal of surgery is what medical term we call optimal debulking. That means less than one centimeter uh, of tumor left that you can actually, yeah, that total that is uh, left in the abdomen. And that's like tumor that you could not remove. And there, there have been studies showing that people that get to this point and then get chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is much better at killing smaller amounts of disease rather than if you left bulky disease left in there, chemotherapy may not be able to penetrate that. So what is the chemotherapy uh, that uh, people with ovarian cancer get? Majority do require chemo. Um, so I've put in like anything more than a stage 1C, and you don't need to memorize that, but basically that is a 1C, that is tumor that is still just in the ovary, but when you wash out the peritoneum, when you wash out the inside of the stomach during surgery, there's some cells that you pick up. So it tells you that no, it has actually spread even though you cannot see it. So anything more than that requires chemotherapy. Anything of, if your um, doctor says you have this particular histology, that means when they look at it under a microscope, that's the way, it like the cell types are this type, clear cell. Um, they need chemotherapy. And then if it's a high grade tumor, so meaning it looks like it's dividing really fast, even if it's just confined to the ovaries, those people need chemotherapy because the risk of it coming back is pretty high. And the chemo regimen, um, the most typical, now there are variations of this, but the most typical is this uh, chemotherapy regimen called uh, carboplatin paclitaxel or carbotaxel for short. It's um, 
typically given IV, but there's another form I'll talk about in a minute. But IV, basically a patient comes in, they have a little IV inserted, they get both of those drugs, and it's given every three weeks. Um, and usually repeat that six times, and that's the duration of the treatment. And at that point, then you see how you've done, and maybe uh, be done with treatment depending on the stage of the patient. Um, and in terms of side effects, it does cause hair loss, it causes some fatigue, and the Taxol medication, the Paclitaxel, can cause neuropathy, that is numbness and tingling in hands and feet, um, and some nausea and some effect on the cell counts, uh, like anemia, a little bit of uh, neutropenia, meaning the white blood cell counts being down. So, but generally, uh, okay tolerated, People get through it okay, even older patients. And, um, and you know, it's not forever. You do about six times of this and that's it. And then you would stop. And then depends on the stage of the person. If it was a localized disease, then you're really done. If it was a high risk uh, patient, then you do scans every once in a while to make sure it hasn't come back. And then if and when it comes back, you retreat it with this or a new regimen, depending on how long it's been. There is another option in terms of giving chemotherapy. It's called intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So for a patient who has advanced disease, but advanced disease that the surgeon has been able to at least take out as much as possible, so less microscopic disease only is left in the abdomen, sometimes people get chemotherapy directly injected into the abdomen. So that's what intraperitoneal is. So what it is something called a port, um, like a little reservoir is inserted under the abdomen. It's different from the usual port that people get that is for blood draws and stuff. This one is in the abdomen. And, um, and then when they need chemo, you know, it just goes directly into that port. The, the, um, the, um, uh, the catheter is inside the belly and basically coats the abdomen, the inside of the abdomen. That's where the disease is. Um, so that is a commonly used regimen too. And um, it has better survival rate uh, in the correct situation compared to the IV, but it has a caveat of being more toxic. Uh, people would usually have more nausea, uh, possibly vomiting, more abdominal pain. So it's, the pa person has to be pretty strong and in good shape uh, before they can go ahead and do this. So not everyone, even in the right clinical scenario, would get this because it, it can be pretty hard to take. <coughs> and then what happens if uh, the, you know, the treatment uh, fails? And, uh, and I know these are all big concepts, and I'm, like I said, I don't have a whole lot of slides, so soon I'm going to uh, open this up for questions. But then you have other options. Um, if it's been a long time since they got that carbotaxel, you try that one again um, because it worked last time and gave you a lot of year, you know, years, hopefully, of remission. Um, if no, it's been only a few months since you tried that, and you have to try something else. And usually it's another IV <laughs> chemotherapy. There are other uh, agents, you know, like something called doxorubicin, another thing called gemcitabine. They're common used chemotherapy agents um, for, um, <coughs> for ovarian cancer. And the best option compared to all of those is a clinical trial. Uh, so that would be a time when somebody has relapsed to ask your doctor, go to a big center, and figure out if there are any clinical studies, something new, some, another new regimen that you could possibly try that could beat what's standard that is out there that you could, that, um, you know, basically have another option in terms of treatment. And another treatment that I wanted to touch briefly on is uh, this thing called a PARP inhibitor. Um, so this is a, a new thing. It's uh, currently approved for BRCA positive patients only. So people who have that gene that I was telling you about that increases the risk of ovarian cancer. And it's a pill that uh, can also be used instead of chemotherapy. It's much better tolerated also, although that can also cause a little bit of upset stomach. And the way it works, um, it's kind of cool. So I put this picture on uh, in here and I'm going to explain a little bit. So what I was saying, and I don't know if you caught this or not, um, PARP inhibitors are pills uh, that have been approved for people who have BRCA positive uh, ovarian cancer. They're actually being uh, studied for breast cancer too, but not yet approved uh, for that indication. And the way they work is uh, this. So basically, um, every day in our bodies, uh, so there's DNA damage. Uh, and our cells need to be able to repair that DNA damage. 
So we have different proteins, different enzymes that help us repair that. So one of them is called um, BRCA. So the BRCA genes that um, are normal genes that we all have and are used for repairing DNA. Another uh, enzyme is called PARP and also is used for repairing DNA. So now in people who have the BRCA mutation, that enzyme is no longer working. So if there's damage to their DNA, let's say by chemo um, or by the cancer, they rely on PARP more so for uh, repairing DNA. So if in people who already have the BRCA knocked out, we give them now a PARP inhibitor too, then that cancer now has a double whammy. It can no longer repair DNA because its BRCA was already not working. Now we are taking out the PARP too. So that's the rationale behind treating patients uh, who have the BRCA positivity, basically have a mutated BRCA, that's what BRCA positivity <laughs> means, it means that that protein is no longer working. You give them this PARP inhibitor too, and they can no longer repair the DNA in that tumor cell, basically. So the tumor cell now, if there's a mistake that happens in its DNA, it can no longer repair it and it dies off. That's the rationale behind it. So a drug um, that has been approved in the US is called Olaparib. That's a PARP inhibitor, that's a pill, and currently approved for people who only have the BRCA. Uh, but is under studies uh, right now to try to see if people who have, you know, like didn't get a BRCA from their parents, but maybe the tumor developed this gene mutation as a, you know, after a while, maybe it can be uh, helpful in them too. So probably more and more people uh, with ovarian cancer will be able to benefit from this new pill. So that's about it for the general overview. In terms of summary, so like I said, it's the leading cause of gynecologic death in the US, uh, fifth leading cause overall of cancer death in women. And um, risk factors, genetics, environmental, or obesity. Um, in terms of treatment, it requires surgery and debulking, followed by chemotherapy. And chemotherapy can either be IV or peritoneal. Peritoneal means the one that is injected inside the abdomen. And PARP inhibitors are a new option uh, for a lot of patients and hopefully more so. And um, now I can open it up for questions. And first of all, can you guys hear me now in the back? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Will do. Uh, yes, sir. How effective are some of these interventions? And uh, Dr. Petty, if you could repeat the question because in the back we can't hear it. Okay, sounds good. So uh, he was asking how effective are these interventions? Depends on the stage. So if someone has a localized ovarian cancer and um, they, you know, they get surgery and they get chemotherapy, um, it could be as good as 70% you know, or so cure rate. If someone has cancer that is more stage three, stage four, the chances are much lower in terms of cure. Now, we can still put in a remission, sometimes many months, sometimes years, and every time it comes back, treat with something else again, and hope for better and better things to come along, but you can't no, you can no longer cure it, and that person, at least with the science we have now, will eventually, uh, the, the ovarian cancer will eventually take their life. But if it's really early stage, then you could make a big difference and be curative. But unfortunately, a lot of ovarian cancer is diagnosed late, like I said, so you cannot cure it. Thank you. Sure. Um, yes, we'll go ahead with you. What is the difference between cure and remission? So when I say remission, I'm sorry, so question was, question was, what's the difference between cure and remission? Five years. It's, it's more basic than that. So cure means it's done, it's gone it's never going to come back, at least that's the goal. Remission means I have the knowledge that I will not be able to cure this as a doctor, but I can put it, go, you know, put it to sleep for a while, let's say, put it not, make it not active for a while, so for a while the patient doesn't have to deal with this, maybe even not be on chemo for a while, but with the knowledge that it's most likely going to come back, and at that point I'll have to treat again. So remission implies it's going to come back. 
So if you already know that from the stage or from whatever, then you, you, have to, you need to have that discussion um, that is my goal cure, is my goal remission? What, and that's the distinction between the two. There were a couple of questions here, yes. So the question was about CA125 and in general, how, how good of a test is it? And is it just for when the cancer is in the ovaries or when it goes elsewhere? So CA125 is a very imperfect test. That's the first thing. So, which is why we don't just do it in women to pick up ovarian cancer. Like, if it was that good a test, every woman, when they go to the doctor, they just have this test and they will know, are they developing ovarian cancer or not? There's a reason we don't do that. Because it doesn't go up with everyone. It doesn't, um, you know, even if they have ovarian cancer. And it can go up, you know, mild amounts, even when there is no ovarian cancer. So, 9 to 17 can be not a lot in somebody, or can be a lot in somebody else who's always been at nine and below. So, and then it, it pertains to ovarian cancer. Sometimes, like the, the other parts of gyne gynecologic you know, cancers too, like sometimes we use it to uterine cancer or the peritoneal cancer. Because it seems like any cancer that involves around there, or even like colon cancer that has gone there sometimes, it can go up. So it has to be taken with the context of everything else. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yes. Does it also include breast cancer? Usually, so they ask, is CM125 also for breast cancer? It's not typically used for that, but because it's an imperfect test, it can go up in some types of breast cancer. But if, when somebody wants to follow breast cancer, usually we try other can markers that are more correlative uh, with breast cancer. Yes. What is the purpose of having your ovaries if you're postmenopausal and if that age that you're saying is 63, why should women keep their ovaries? Do they continue working throughout your lifetime? I mean, if, if this is a, a risk that women should be aware of, since it's such a deadly outcome, mm -hmm. so why couldn't you have your ovaries? The question is, shouldn't everybody go and get surgery right now and get the ovaries removed? So. There is no purpose. There is no purpose to the ovaries after menopause. That's the first part. There is no purpose. They don't do anything that is of significance. But the reason we don't say everybody just go and take out the ovaries is I told you, like, if you really want to take out the ovaries and reduce ovarian cancer risk, it's much more involved than a simple ovophorectomy. You need to take out the lymph nodes. You need to take out the lining of the stomach. So all that does add morbidity, does add risk of complications, does add risk of abdominal issues, um, bowel issues down the line. Any surgery does that. And the risk is not that high in the average person to warrant the other things that would come for sure. But now let's say somebody had the BRCA gene. That changes this equation. So if somebody had that bad gene, when I know that person's ovarian cancer risk is you know, 30% or higher, then usually we recommend those people after childbearing age to have their ovaries removed before there's ovarian cancer. Yes? If ultrasound is how it's spotted and picked up, why wouldn't high-risk people be asked to do an ultrasound every few years? Or five they are. Years? They are. The right so people who have, let's say, bad family history of ovarian cancer or they have the gene, um, before they take their ovaries out, let's say they're still you know, childbearing age and they want to keep their ovaries for now, they, every six months they should have ovarian ultrasound, they should have the CA125 as a way of keeping tabs on it. So if, what about high-risk breast cancer? So the average person with breast cancer is not at a high risk of ovarian cancer. It's only for people who have the gene. Yes? Could you talk about Avastin, please? Yeah. Thank you. So I didn't touch base on Avastin. So Avastin is an IV medicine, but it's not quite chemo. 
it's um, basically an antibody to blood vessels. And it's used in a lot of different cancers, including ovarian cancer. And um, it can improve survival, too. Um, so a lot of times we combine it. I just didn't want to go through the various things that can be done. But yes, uh, Evastin a lot of times is combined with carbotaxel, either at the first time you treat or afterwards, or maybe maintenance kind of thing, um, to try to improve survival. Also, could you talk about recurrence? Because I know that with ovarian cancer at a high stage, it's 90%. It will come back. But is there not, um, it's more promising that the person's cancer can be managed the longer the interval between the treatment? So the question is, isn't it, is it a good thing the longer it goes between yes. remissions? Absolutely. Yes. yes, it is. So, and that also changes what kind of treatments we would do. Um, so like I said, if it's been a long time since somebody got carbotaxel, we'll try that again. And the longer the remission, it tells me the more hopefully indolent cancer that person has. What is so typically more than six months is what we talk about. So if it's been less than six months, they were asking what is the interval you look at before you retreat with some chemotherapy or not. So it has to have lasted at least six months in terms of remission. If it hasn't, then it's not worth to try that again. You should really try something else. Um, you know, try somebody who hasn't asked a question yet, yes. Can you talk about malaria and ovarian cancer? So there are different types of, as she was asking, malaria and cancer. What about that? And a little bit talking about that. It's just one type of ovarian cancer. There are different cell types. Um, like when a pathologist looks at, their, at someone's tissue, um, cells look differently, depending on where they start out from in the different types uh, of cells inside the ovary. So the most common type is called a serous type. Um, and then other types are clear cell, which what I mentioned. Another type is malarian uh, uh, cell type. They're just different, but they're treated the same. So malarian is treated just like I talked about. So for the most part, they're treated the same. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we'll speak more about um, the PARP inhibitors, specifically all the PARP for non-BRCA gene people. So the question was um, PARP inhibitors for non-BRCA gene uh, patients. And if I could speak a little bit more about that. So they're, they're not approved yet, let's say, for people who are non-BRCA positive. But there is. Um, good evidence based on some European trials that people who have the BRCA gene mutation, um, there's germline and there's tumor BRCA. So germline means you inherited it from your parents. So all your cells in your body have the BRCA mutation. Tumor BRCA mutation means, no, you didn't get it from your parents, but your tumor has developed that mutation. So only that, uh, not only the tumor itself has the BRCA. So there seems to be some evidence that even if it's not every cell and it's just the tumor itself, those people also benefit. So I, but I think at this point, it should probably be in the context of a clinical trial. And I don't, I don't even know if insurance would approve it for the most part. Um, but there's good evidence that it could work uh, in a lot of those patients who are not even BRCA positive. And we're trying to pinpoint that and try to figure that out. I uh, guess you. Yeah, Matt. Um, I have had the ovarian cancer and then had nine sessions of chemo. Can you speak sessions. up a little? I'll repeat, I'll repeat. Is that standard or was there more of a problem before they went further? So she was asking, um, when she got ovarian cancer, she got nine treatment sessions. Um, and is that more than she should have or why did she get nine? It's hard for me to say. I can tell you average is six. But suppose somebody was doing great at a time of six, and on scan, the oncologist would say that there's a good amount of cancer left, and it's still improving. So that would be an indication to continue. Nothing is set in stone. It's just that six is the standard. Yes, I just need to ask another one. Uh, after, after 10 or 12 years of the surgery, I developed a problem that was removed completely. <coughs> Does the spleen play much of a part in fighting cancer cells? So she was asking um, her spleen had to be removed at some point due to cancer complications and 
does that pose a problem? And it doesn't. So spleen is really for fighting some particular types of infections. So as, so, as long as your um, doctor has given you special vaccines that are for people who have had their spleen removed, then it's fine. That's OK. Thank you. Sure. Yes. What can you tell me about brachy radiation? OK. So they were asking about brachy radiation and about that. So what is brachy radiation? Um, it's basically radiation that is slow, usually with things actually inserted um, that give radiation uh, inside the body for a specific amount of time and then removed. Um, so sometimes that is used, um, but is not a standard for most stages, let's say. Um, if somebody has a very localized ovarian cancer and they think that combined with chemotherapy or instead of chemotherapy can do the job, depending on a case-by-case -case basis that can be used. But it's not standard for most ovarian cancers, let's say. I, I had it and, and uh, I had leiomyosarcoma in, in, the, in, in, a, in my uterus. Anyway, uh, it just raised hell with my bowel tract, my mm -hmm. urinary tract, my vaginal tract, everything. And I mean, I went through like four years of pure hell. I finally found out from somebody who comes here Somebody suggested going, uh, I mean, I had literally no control over diarrhea, urine, anything. And somebody who comes here said, try aloe vera, drinking aloe vera juice. And it, it, was, it was a miracle for me. Mm. It didn't help the urinary thing. I accidentally, a few months ago, went on, um, what's the dietary thing? The Probiotics? No, the, the diet where you take or you only use a certain kind that you don't use wheat. Oh, gluten? Okay, I went on gluten uh, thing for joint pain. Uh -huh. And it cured up my urinary tract, which had been oh, in total goodness. disarray for, for four years. I mean, but, but they don't give enough. My doctor didn't say anything about, about the, the effects of this brachytherapy. And, and he didn't, this wasn't my, this wasn't the gynecologist I'd go to. This was an other doctor at UCLA. He didn't follow up with me, nothing. It, it was my lack of care for that particular brachy radiation was hell. I tell everybody who, who will listen, never, never, never go on brachy therapy. So the thing is, um, first of all, you had you didn't have ovarian cancer. It was uh, leiomyosarcoma, right, of the uterus. Um, Brachytherapy has issues, that's for sure. Um, because when you radiate and something is inserted there, it also affects the bowels, affects everything around it. Um, so it does have a lot of risk of complications. So like I said, it's not standard So for most. But, but I don't want to go th too much into that particular detail because first of all, I don't know all your case. Um, and it's a different cancer, actually. The other thing I got yes. was a I'm going to ask you if you have other people ask okay. questions Sorry. to make sure we get everybody who yes. has a question. What is the name Thank you. Therapy? I didn't hear. Name of what? This therapy. Brachy therapy. Brachy. Brachy. Um, yes, ma'am. What do you know about the treatment that is non-chemos, um, which is double, single, single between the uh, carbo tax? carboplatinum and taxol, then taxol, taxol, done three rounds, the surgery, and then a repeat of that. I'm not sure I understand. I got the three part, but what was the thing about the chemo? All right, nine sessions of chemo, uh -huh. then surgery, then nine sessions of chemo. But the nine sessions of chemo are really in three rounds. Okay. Double, single, single, double. Okay. So she was asking specifically about a um, variation of the chemo instead of every three weeks and you basically do like weekly and then you take a week off and something like that. Um, it's a case by case thing. For the most part, we know that the every three weeks does the job just as well as the weekly and is more convenient. Um, and so for the, we used to do weekly more often. There was some research earlier that suggested the weekly is maybe better. But um, the current understanding more recently is that every three weeks is just fine. So 
And so that's one part of it. And then the other part is what about doing some before surgery and after surgery? And that's really a case by case thing. So if your doctors didn't think that they could do surgery up front, that, but they could get it smaller a little bit and then go for surgery, that would be a reason to do that. And, sir, you had a question. If you are currently in remission, mm -hmm. can your goal not be cure? Depends on, so the question was, if you're currently in remission, can your goal be cure? I, I can't comment the, uh, unless knowing the exact situation. If somebody had stage four ovarian cancer, let's say, and they're in remission, that is not going to be a cure. But if it was a stage three, yes, it could be. Uh, it could have been that remission turned into a cure, and they really don't have to deal with this again, depending on the situation. Sorry, new person, and then I'll get back to you. <coughs> yes. Um, I'd like to go back to the question that the lady asked about uterus. And, uh, I have a prolapsed uterus, and my gynecologist said, well, you know, why don't you have an operation? And I said, okay, but take out my ovaries, too, because I knew that you could. Anyway, and he said it's a much more complicated operation. And you hit on that a little bit. Can you explain how much more complicated it is. And, and I guess that in my case, I probably should ask for a BRCA test before I would do anything. So the question is, is somebody having a surgery, let's say, for prolapsed uterus, um, how, more complicated, how much more complicated it is to take out the ovaries than two, and should they ask for a BRCA gene uh, testing beforehand? First of all, I'm not a surgeon. That's number one. So I can't tell you the exact things that a surgeon would possibly do. But a prolapsed uterus uh, or like a hysterectomy can be done laparoscopically. Right. Um, that's one thing. So taking out the ovaries in addition could be done laparoscopically too, but it's a little bit more involved. Um, it's more difficult. And if somebody is really worried about ovarian cancer, that still is not enough. Because like I said, you need the lymph nodes too, you need the lining of the stomach too, you need all those things. Then that cannot be done laparoscopically. And then in terms of BRCA gene, I wouldn't recommend that for everyone. That first of all, insurance won't approve it. And second, very low likelihood that an average person is gonna have the BRCA. In people who have, you know, are diagnosed with breast ovarian cancer, then you have a high chance of finding it. But the average population is less than one percent. Um, Get Dr. Drucker. Yes. Anything yeah, being done right. with immunotherapy, creating smart T cells that can find the uh, malignant cells anywhere without affecting the healthy tissue? So the question was anything about immunotherapy and having the immune system attack of brain cancer. So this is a hot topic in oncology in general right now. And we're trying it with every different kind of cancer and trying to figure out who would benefit from it and who wouldn't. Um, it, we've made a lot of progress in lung cancer, melanoma, um, maybe colon cancer, um, but we're not there yet for breast and ovarian. Um, so that is done only on a trial basis right now, uh, but we don't know yet who benefits and who doesn't. Sure. Yes. This is not related to ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. but I have cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about a lot of different places in the female anatomy. Where does cervical cancer fall and would, would the treatments be the same? So treatment is similar but not exactly the same. The, the question was cervical cancer and how much it differs from what I just talked about. Um, so cervical cancer usually also needs surgery, um, but is more focused on the uterus rather than the ovaries. Um, so that part is there. But if it's locally advanced, the cervical cancer, actually a lot of times we don't do surgery and we do chemo and radiation together. So, so that is a major difference between the two. Radiation is much more common, loose, not breaky, it's more outside kind of radiation, um, combined with chemotherapy, and that is more commonly used as cervical. If it's really advanced cervical, let's say stage four or metastatic, then it becomes identical to ovarian cancer in terms of the chemo. A lot of times it's the same carbotaxel, and that, the rest is the same. And also, PARP has not really been shown to be helpful the PARP inhibitors for cervical. So those are the main differences. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, 
Yes, please. Go ahead. Is there a relationship between infertility drugs and then years and years later ovarian cancer or reproductive cancers? Any relationship between infertility drugs and ovarian cancer, basically. Not that we know of. Um, infertility in general, though, is a risk factor. So that's a little bit, you know, hard can be to tease out. Yes? Would you speak to the um, usage of, like, Nupogen and Nulasta in conjunction with chemo? So question in terms of Nupogen, Nulasta, and combine, combination with chemo. So Nupogen, Nulasta are injections that one would get to bring up their white blood cell count because chemo takes a hit on a lot of different things that you don't necessarily want it to want them to take a hit like white blood cells and people who take a hit in that then they are at a higher risk for infections um, so sometimes in combination with chemotherapy um, either because somebody has developed an infection, so you want to prevent it in the future, or <coughs> prophylactically, meaning even before they have an infection, you just start them on these medications if you know that chemo is prone to giving them problems or has high risk of giving them problems. This carbotaxel is not one that requires Nulasta or Nupogen standard for everyone. Most people do just fine and they don't need a growth factor. Um, but they're case by case things. If somebody's older, more frail, or they have medical problems, then maybe they should. Or if they even run into problems, then they should for future. Um, yes? I'm now platinum resistant. Does it ever go back to being platinum sensitive? She said that she's <laughs> platinum resistant. Does it ever go back to being platinum sensitive? First of all, what does that mean? Um, platinum. Basically, is those drugs I talked about, carboplatin, um, that's the chemo. And that's the backbone of a lot of times the chemotherapy regimen that you give. But if somebody hasn't responded and it's been less than six months, the six months that I told you about, and the cancer comes back after carboplatin, you turn, you, that person is termed platinum resistant. So their cancer doesn't respond to platinum and typically doesn't become sensitive. Once it becomes resistant, you just cross that off your list and you just move on to other chemo drugs. Yes? If the BRCA gene is sort of the indicator of a high risk to potentially cancer situation, why wouldn't that be considered a pre, you know, a um, approved, um, what's the word, you know, approved in insurance to pre preventative, a test that's preventative? Why is insurance not covering it if it's obviously the only indicator? Of so why doesn't insurance just cover BRCA, uh, gene testing for everyone, uh, as a preventative kind of thing. Um, it's expensive, uh, the gene testing. And so for everything, anything that insurance approves, there's a cost-benefit ratio. They have to be able to prove how many people's lives they will save. So insurance companies would approve it for someone who has a family history. Let's say there's ovarian cancer in a young person in that family, um, or that person was diagnosed with breast cancer at a young age, also a risk factor for having the BRCA. So a lot of people would approve, be approved, and most people who are going to have the BRCA would be approved, or like family members who have, of somebody who has BRCA, things like that. But for the average population, like I said, is way less than 1%. So if you tested everyone for that, most people would be negative and it's cost prohibitory. Yes? Um, I was told after my sixth round of chemo, I will be put on an estrogen blocker pill. How effective is that if there are still some cells? So the question was, um, after six rounds of chemo, uh, being told that you're, not, you're now on anti-estrogen treatments, and how effective is that, and what's the point of that, I guess? So a lot of ovarian and uterine cancers are also dependent on estrogen for growing, but not most, uh, meaning not all, sorry, I should say not all. Um, it's not standard, let's say, to do that, uh, but if someone is at high risk, for cancer coming back, um, or they, you think that it is po it, they are estrogen positive, more so for endometrial cancer, more so for uterine cancer rather than ovarian cancer, then you would put them on an anti-estrogen pill. And usually they're well tolerated and don't have a whole lot of side effects. Um, so it's a case-by-case -case thing, but it's not a standard for everyone. Well, the pathology report during the operation stated the estrogen inhibitor would with my cancer would be very beneficial. So that's what I meant if your tumor is estrogen positive. Right. 
So if the pathology report says that your tumor is estrogen positive, then that's something to consider. So what, how is that going to help if there is still cancer cells? Will it keep it dormant or what? It's hard to know because there's not enough studies on this, whether that cures somebody or just puts it in a longer remission. I would say probably is the second longer remission rather than cure if they were not cured already. Um, but basically what it does is drives the tumor cells from estrogen and if your pathology report shows that your tumor is estrogen positive, that means it, they rely on estrogen at least partly for growth. So depriving them of estrogen hopefully kills some of them. It's unclear whether it will kill all. Um, yes? How effective is Almenta for somebody who, uh, for whom carboplatin has stopped working? I'm sorry, what was the drug in? Alimta. Alimta, Alimta. okay. Um, I'm sorry, to the back, um, what time is it? But I do have to go to clinic at some point. I'm sorry, what? 20 o'clock, I'm with you till 1.30. Yes, but unfortunately I cannot stay till 1.30. Um, if you could tell me in about five, 10 minutes or so, I will have to unfortunately head out. Um, so the question was how effective is Alimta? Um, Alimta, other name for it is Pemetrexid, is a chemotherapy regimen that is um, thought to be pretty effective uh, as one of the lines of therapy that you can have, that you can use against ovarian cancer and a lot of different cancers. Um, it's given every three weeks. It's generally well tolerated too. You know, there was a question back here from this gentleman. You can get to ask him. Uh, you mentioned the drug earlier, Alimta. Yes. Uh, what about Avastin? Avastin. Yeah, could you address that? Is that in addition to chemo or alongside it? It's alongside it. So you do that at the same time. So why would you not use that ordinarily? It can have, even though it's not chemo, it can have side effects. So the main side effects of Avastin are it can bring up the blood pressure if somebody has blood pressure issues, um, not just mildly to the point that is actually problematic. Um, and in, it can rarely cause what we call perforation of the bowel, um, which is not a good problem to have. So basically holes in the bowel. So if somebody is at risk for that, meaning they have like tumor adhering to their bowels, let's say, then you shouldn't use that either. But for most people, it's okay and doesn't cause issues, so it is used as part of the treatment. Can you spell it? Avastin, so it's A-V-A-S-T-I-N. A Baston. Yes. How much should I worry about all the radiation I get from CT scans? Though I'm grateful for them because they're, uh, it's the only test that picks, picked up my, uh, my, my uh, cancer because the, the ultrasound is not picked up. I had it two weeks before and it was 10, 10 centimeters, so it was big. Question is um, how worried to be about regular CT scans in terms of radiation from that? So, depends on the situation. So if somebody has metastatic cancer, I would say don't worry about that. Because at this point, if this causes cancer, it's gonna be many, 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 many years down the line. That's only increased risk of cancer. We have much bigger problems right now. Like how many years? 20 plus years, something like that. Um, and that's only increased. It's not like it's going to cause cancer. It's just slight increased risk compared to otherwise. So for most people, I would say don't worry about it. But if somebody has localized cancer, we think we've cured it, it's been posted more than five years, maybe that person doesn't need CT scans very regularly. So you can cut back at that point. But for the average person who your doctor says you need the CT scan, don't worry about it, it's going to be okay. Yes? Why can estrogen patches be used after ovarian cancer surgery? Mm -hmm. Repeat the question. Why can, estrogen can they or cannot? Can. Typically, I don't have people on estrogen patches, so that's why I'm not clear about the question. That's very okay, so she was asking why are estrogen patches used after surgery, and that is not something that I see, so I'm not sure. Or in general, they did not ask a question, and that will be the last question. Anybody who didn't get to ask a question? Mm. Yes, sir. 
He had to ask the question, but he has a question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there, there it was. Now, w would, you, would you speak on to the pros and cons of HRT with respect to ovarian cancer? So HRT, hormone replacement uh, therapy, um, and pros and cons of that. So it does increase the risk of ovarian cancer, likely, and it does increase the risk of breast cancer as well. So yeah. it's protective for the heart, but we think the, uh, the cancer risks are outweigh the benefits. Um, so for the average person, stay away from HRT. That's Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay.